Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, please feel free to get food uh, leisurely and while you're listening, and uh, go back and get more food, I guess, uh, if you need it uh, as you're listening. Uh, but we can proceed with the uh, proceedings as, as you, while you're doing that. Um, those of you who saw an early agenda may, be, may think that I'm Bernard Nalen, the Deputy Coordinator for the President's Malaria Initiative. I'm not Bernard Nalen. Uh, my name is Carter Diggs. Bernard had a uh, conflict that he just couldn't uh, deal with in terms of uh, the decision and, and couldn't make it. And he asked me to, to fill in, which I'm very happy to do and be a part of this celebration. Uh, uh, I am uh, involved with the USAID Malaria Vaccine Development Program. And as such, very, very comfortable in this building. I have many colleagues. We work closely with MVI been a very fruitful relationship over a number of years now and uh, moving towards uh, that aspect of, uh, of the solution to the problem, if you will. Of course, uh, and I could, I could speak with you uh, ad nauseum, you know, about the Malaria Vaccine Development Program. I'm not going to do that. That's not what this is about uh, only. We're here to look at the problem of malaria writ large and particularly to celebrate past contributions uh, to, to uh, solutions to the problem. So I think that you, everyone here uh, is aware of the rather dramatic progress that's been made in the field in terms of mitigation of morbidity and mortality in the last five, six, seven years. Um, and that's due to the work of a lot of people. The PMI certainly started in that time frame, the President's Malaria Initiative. If Bernard were here, he could tell you a lot more than I can about it. Uh, Linda Banda is here and with the PMI. Where are you, Linda? Yep, raise your hand. So Linda will, can talk to you at length about the PMI as well um, during the discussion period or later. Um, the, what I will say about the PMI is that uh, this approach is uh, a matter of delivering, working with countries, 17 countries I believe now, uh, to scale up known interventions uh, to uh, achieve significant impact. And I'm talking about, you know, the usual suspects, uh, impregnated uh, nets, uh, indoor residual spraying, um, and uh, rapid diagnosis, and artemisinin combination therapy. So the major progress has been made, but I think many people um, in and outside of the, the endeavor are uh, worried now about the future in the sense that uh, if, you, if you relax your vigilance, which is likely to happen when funds uh, diminish or, and or when it looks like you're succeeding, that's exactly when the parasite will bite back with a vengeance. So we need to, what we really need to do is to, to try to be smarter than the parasite. So far we've failed to do that. But that's what that's what that's what is called for here to try to learn tricks that the learn the parasites tricks and circumvent them, and that's what Path is is trying to do uh, in in many ways, uh, in um, with Masepa, in which they are looking at what's happening on the ground, surveillance, trying to catch the parasite doing its tricks, and then design appropriate strategies to circumvent those tricks. And through MVI, uh, trying to produce new modalities, vaccines that can be added to, to malaria control programs. And then through their new affiliate, One World Health, doing some really amazing things with technology, new technology uh, to develop drugs. Uh, an, another source of artemisinin, for example. So today, we uh, would be very fortunate to hear three distinguished speakers. Yu Chang is the CEO of One World Health on the screen. Good morning, Yu. Oh, good. Yes, I guess. Good morning. It's almost afternoon for you in Seattle. It is afternoon, I guess, yeah. Actually, we're the other way. Oh, OK. Well, <laughs> you're right. I, I, I always make that mistake. Yeah, right. So my condolences for uh, the hour. Yeah, right. Uh, Rick Steckety with Masepa, and David Caslow, the new director of uh, MVI. And I want to say that uh, 
Well, David and I go back a long ways. We, you know, as they say, uh, David's most recent position before joining MVI was Vice President of Vaccines and Infectious Diseases at Merck, where he learned the craft of vaccine development uh, to a, a fine level and is bringing that expertise to MVI. But he, uh, he got his obsession uh, some years ago at NIH and has not, hadn't been able to shake it off. And so I think in his own words, he said that it's unfinished business that he hadn't taken care of, and now he wants to, wants to take care of it. So David, the uh, floor is yours. Look forward to hearing from you. Really glad you're here. Thank you very much, Carter. I really appreciate it. And good morning and welcome to, uh, to PATH. Now, I would like to take um, a minute or two this morning just to tell you how great it is to be back in Washington, D.C., and to be, um, to be back working 24-7 on, um, is it on? A little closer. There you go. So, um, and also, it's indeed an honor, actually, to be joining the team here at uh, the PATH Malaria Vac Vaccine Initiative at a really interesting point in um, MVI's history. Having served three years as MVI's, um, on MVI's external advisory um, committee, I've had the opportunity, actually, have taken the advantage of being able to watch development here um, one step removed and to really see what MVI has brought visibly and publicly to the efforts of developing a malaria vaccine, but also to see what's um, completely behind the scenes sometimes in terms of um, vaccine development. And there are three things that I'd like to, um, to share with you this morning that I hope will help you, help you see how um, MVI and the program here at PATH, as I've come to see it both as, the, um, as an external advisor and then as the new director of actually moving things forward in terms of malaria vaccine development. And the first is, is that MVI is all about partners. It, um, next week, I hope some of you will be able to join us on um, Capitol Hill for the Malaria R&D Expo. Um, and there you can meet some of MVI's partners from outside the Beltway, um, Johns Hopkins, University of Maryland, Seattle Biomed, Novio Pharmaceuticals, and Emory Inter University, just to name a few of the more than 50 partners that we work with here around the world at MVI. But here today, um, however, I think it's important that MVI acknowledge our partners in the U.S. government, um, whether it's at USAID, the National Institutes of Health, the Department of Defense, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or the FDA. Um, and to take a historical perspective, um, malaria and the U.S. government go way back, actually, to the founding of this country, because one of the first um, military expenditures of the Continental Congress was $300 to buy quinine for George Washington's troops. So fast forward about uh, 200 years later in the mid-1980s, um, it was researchers at Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, or RARE, that partnered with um, researchers then at Smith Klein Beecham in the development of an investigational vaccine, which we now call RTSS. And today, RTSS, this candidate, is under development by GlaxoSmithKline in partnership with MVI and is in actually in the very late stages of development in, in Africa, across Africa. And of the 11 sites, that are involved in this very large-scale um, safety and efficacy trial. Three are in Kenya, two of which are run with U.S. government partners, one with Walter Reed and the other with, uh, with CDC. Back here in the United States, MVI has partnered with the U.S. military um, malaria vaccine program, whether through RARE or the Navy Medical Research Center, in over a half a dozen projects over the last um, two years. And as I mentioned, the CDC is the northern partner to one of the RTSS trial sites in Kenya, um, all of which are part of the Kemri Medical Research Institute. And there in Kasumu, Kenya, African scientists are in key leadership roles in keeping with CDC's mission to create the expertise, information, and tools 
to protect um, people's health. And this is a vital aspect um, of CDC's work and has made the CDC a source of malaria expertise around the world, be it the head of the um, WHO's um, Global Malaria Program, which came from the CDC, or my colleague here today, um, Rick Steckany. So equally important is the CDC's role as the implementing agency for the President's Malaria Vaccine Initiative that ensures that bed nets, drugs, rapid diagnostics, as perhaps one day, hopefully, a vaccine can reach the right people in the right place as quickly as possible. Like the U.S. military, the National Institutes of Health are also a constant source of life-saving health research and innovation. And MVI's relationship with the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at NIH are longstanding and deep. Today, MVI is partnering with the Laboratory of Malaria Immunology and Vaccinology at NIAD in a pivotal first-in-human trial of a transmission-blocking vaccine approach, which I'll come back to at the end. We're also partnering with the Laboratory of Malaria and Vector Research in developing and run, running standardized assays to support many of our vaccine feasibility and translational research projects. Last but not least, our partners at USAID, which has made possible important work on the blood stage vaccine approaches, filling a critical gap in the funding landscape and helping to ensure that we don't close off any options or shut any doors in our search for an effective malaria vaccine. USAID has also supported crucial process development and manufacturing work in another vaccine project undertaken by MVI. This is one done in um, partnership with the uh, vaccine division of Johnson & Johnson. And then that um, project had moved into the clinic with support by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And this particular project is just another of MVI's drive to next generation vaccines even as we work to hope to, um, to do the groundwork for the world's first um, malaria vaccine, hopefully RTSS. So the power of partnering with the public sector is critical, and malaria vaccine research simply would not be where it is today without the contributions of the U.S. government over many, many years. And what makes history so exciting, however, is the way that MVI has been able to bring diverse public and private sector partners together, and as a result, to deliver on our mission of accelerating vaccine development. And MVI is privileged to work with all of them, either as partners, as collaborators, as co-investigators, and as scientists. Which brings me to my second point, and that is, is that MVI is all about the science. Since, it, since MVI's beginning at PATH in 1999, MVI has rigorously assessed dozens and dozens of projects for their scientific merit at the outset, then assessed again when specific milestones are reached according to agreed upon criteria. Outside experts are brought in on projects on a regular basis to assure that we are making the best data-driven decisions. And based on these objective assessments of data, MVI has had actually to make the very hard but data-driven decisions to kill projects that don't have the legs to go the distance to either regulatory approval and or feasible implementation. Which leads me to that the science actually has to work in the field. And so the other half of MVI's mission is about availability and access. This means that a vaccine like RTSS not only has to show impact in reducing disease, but it also has to be shown that it can be delivered in a way that works for the kids and their parents, that works in the country and in the local health care system, and that it works with existing control measures, as Rick will talk to you about. And my third and final point is, is that MVI is firmly focused on the future while learning from the past. So every project, whether it's killed or it moves to the next stage of development, contributes to our knowledge base. MVI works across a whole portfolio of projects so that we can quickly apply the lessons learned from one to another project, and perhaps most importantly, hone in and ask the right product development as well as scientific questions. So what comes next? At the end of this year, a second set of results are scheduled to be available on RTSS from the large phase three trial ongoing in Africa. And these results should tell us how much RTSS 
reduces malaria illnesses in infants, the primary age group for whom this vaccine is currently being developed. And we're keen to learn whether or not the data in infants will confirm what we saw in the older kids last year, which is a roughly 50% reduction in malaria cases among those receiving the vaccine. We anticipate that we'll have all the results at the end of 2014, following which our partner GSK will be able to submit a full data package to the European equivalent of the US FDA and to the World Health Organization. In the meantime, GSK and MVI are planning a post-approval program that includes studies to track vaccine safety on an even larger scale than that which was done in the phase three trial and to, under, to better understand how RTSS will work in real life vaccination programs. And then looking further ahead to that much longer term goal of malaria elimination and hopefully eradication, we have to think critically about the next generation vaccines or vaccines that will need to be brought to bear along with other malaria interventions. We live in a changing world and the goals that were set a decade ago for malaria vaccines may no longer make sense today. We have to identify the goals that are based on on where the science is going and where the disease is going. And of course, we have to do it um, as partners with, with others, because that is really the only way we'll succeed. So in closing, I'd like to mention one other project at MVI, and I'd like to share with you a vivid memory I have of a visit with a village chief in Bankumana, Mali, probably more than a decade ago, as we were, test as we were discussing with the village chief testing vaccines in his village. And it's a discussion I had many times in the United States, and it was about this new idea or new approach of a transmission blocking vaccine. And the idea was to vaccinate people so that they make antibodies. And when those antibodies were taken up by the mosquito, that they prevented that mosquito from transmitting malaria to others in the village. And it was crystal clear that the chief got that concept immediately. This idea of vaccinating people, not for the direct benefit, but to protect the whole village. And what he said was, we need this vaccine, we want this vaccine, and we would use this vaccine. So it's great to be part of the team here at MVI, where it's about partners, it's about the science, and it's about the future. And I do look forward to our discussion later on. Thank you. David, uh, very nice uh, presentation of a lot of issues, a lot of history, and a lot of problems downstream, a lot of work to be done. If anybody has a burning question, uh, we can take it, but I think that it'll probably most of our discussion will be after all the speakers have, uh, I don't see any burning, so we'll, uh, we'll move ahead. So our next speaker is Rick Steckety, as I said before. Rick has had a distinguished career. I won't try to go through his the whole history of it, but uh, needless to say, uh, branch chief of malaria at CDC for many, many years. You know, and uh, now, as I said before, uh, science director for MSEPA. And in between, you know, many other forays into, into the field and into the laboratory, uh, distinguished career in, in malariology. So, Rick, look forward to hearing your comments. Thanks very much, Carter, and uh, thanks for everybody showing up this morning. It's nice to see some familiar faces as well as some folks that I don't know. So, uh, and and also welcome to David. It's uh, it's a real pleasure to have uh, David in the MVI team and uh, and a colleague here at PATH. So. Um, <clears throat> as Carter mentioned, I've, I've had a checkered career. I've worked in a number of uh, different organizations. Um, been with PATH now and, and the MASEPA program since, uh, since 2005. And, um, and that's, and have been working in the field of malaria, well, depending upon when you call it, it's starting, well, at close to, closing in on 30 years. So. Um, it's interesting to, to view the change. I get a few, few minutes here to talk about the successes 
And one thing I would say is that, you know, having been in the field for 30 years, the or near 30 years, the um, the speed of change is increasing. So we're dealing with acceleration here as opposed to um, a constant speed. And I say that because, you know, the it's been just over a decade that rollback malaria has been underway. Um, it's arguable that in the first five years of rollback malaria, there was a lot of preparatory work, but not much actual change in the field. And subsequently, um, let's say the last five, six years, it's actually been remarkable. What happened in roughly 2005 was that the Global Fund had come on board a little earlier, and by 2005, funding was actually available and moving in countries. The World Bank Booster Program started its funding effort um, specifically through IDA loans to countries and designating that for malaria work. And the U.S. President's Malaria Initiative began um, initially in 15 countries and has had a huge impact in terms of support for those countries as part of that partnership. So that meant that there were about five, five years or so of preparation, sometimes frustrating preparation, followed by money. And money makes a difference. It makes a difference when you actually have good science and a, a developed program that has clear recommendations for a set of interventions that have a scientific basis behind them. And that has led to probably the most remarkable success in, a, in child survival in my lifetime. That is a specific disease that has been categorically altered by what we've done. We've done that as a partnership. There's no, there's little question about that. And sometimes, you know, that, for those of us who have worked in this field for a long time, there are certain words that kind of dull over the years. And partnership is one of them. And integration is another. And sustainability is a, a third. And there are others that <clears throat> you hear those words and you kind of go, you know, I'll go. But to be honest, you know, you only understand whether or not they work when you look backwards and say, oh my God, you know, between the Global Fund and the World Bank and the USAID and CDC and the President's Malaria Initiative and the number of other partners who have entered this field have made a difference. And the countries showed that they could deliver. So with that support, it's actually been a country ownership issue that was espoused by all of those organizations as well that has shown that they could deliver. So, so people said, you know, insecticide treated nets in every household? How are we going to do that? Well, it's been done. Indoor residual spraying in all those targeted households? Yeah, the coverage is only in the high 80s, low 90 percentile. I mean, they can do it, okay? So this has been one of those situations where there has been a set of resources, still inadequate, but has made an enormous amount of difference. So if you walk away from anything today, let me just say that success is about people pulling together and putting money behind it and using the money well, and it's actually been done in malaria control. So we saved this past year probably about 300,000 child lives that would have died from malaria had we not been doing what we're doing. And the number, so a few, a few numbers to try and push a couple of issues. One is that we had used the figure that there were a million child deaths each year from malaria around the world. And we've had that figure for a number of years. You could argue that's because we didn't actually know what the number was, um, but the better we get at counting that number, the more we realize that the numbers start to add up. That is, our estimates at country level across the many countries have shown that this has systematically been coming down since 2005, at the same time that population growth would have normally just driven it up. 
Okay, so in the last decade in sub-Saharan Africa, the population has increased about 28%. That means 28% more children available to get malaria and to potentially die from malaria if we weren't doing what we were doing. And we cut malaria deaths by 40% given the additional 28% that we were, had in population growth. So that's really in excess of a 50% reduction in mortality in really five, six years. Show me something else that gets that. Okay, measles vaccine got that. So vaccines are huge, but our package of malaria control has been really remarkable. Let me mention this, you know, I, I touched on this idea of speed of change. So we're actually still in the midst of that speed of change. The techno one example is the technologies that are available around the world that weren't there five, ten years ago. So cell phones. So cell phones is the classic example. In sub-Saharan Africa, people didn't have phones. Well, they still don't have landlines in many places, but they now have cell phone coverage that is, you know, absolutely remarkable. So our ability to communicate whether it's for surveillance from health facilities around the country reporting on their, their cases and their uh, severe disease and their death, or whether it's just people talking to each other, that's an example of how much change has occurred in an incredibly short period of time. And the uptake of that technology, fairly sophisticated technology, is happening at village level in what people worried wouldn't, you know, is populations that wouldn't be able to pick this up? And the answer is they do. So, speed of change. What were we doing 10 years ago in malaria? Well, we were talking about insecticide treated nets. We had them and we had to put insecticide on them on, a, on an annual basis in order to keep that up. Now we have longer lasting nets and we're getting even longer lasting nets, both for the net as well as for the insecticide on it. And those are in households at quite high levels. Still work to be done, but it's a remarkable difference from where we were a decade ago, where coverage was low and that which was covered was nets that needed to be treated every year. Indoor residual spraying, an intervention that had origins back into the 40s and 50s and stopped using it and then started it up again as part of the package for vector control. So today we use indoor residual spraying. We had it available to us, but a decade ago, to be honest, it wasn't being used. Diagnostics. We had microscopes and slides and a few kids got their fingers stuck and were tested for malaria usually only if they were going to be hospitalized and needed s serious treatment for their severe disease. Today we have rapid diagnostic tests. You will hear that they're imperfect, but boy, they're so much more perfect than what we had before. It's really changed the scene in terms of how we apply or can apply our drugs. And our drugs are different. The drugs we use today were not even on the market a decade ago. So that is, you know, this is history, but it's also about using our understanding of biology, our understanding of moving that biology forward into product development and making a difference. And so that brings me just back to the comment about the vaccine. You know, the world has said that we can't eliminate malaria until we have new tools, like a vaccine. Well, I'd argue we've had new tools coming along almost every year are updated, improved, and what we do today is categorically different, and we really hope that what we do in the next couple of years is again categorically different. And we have that opportunity. So maybe to bring this to kind of a, a final point, and that is where is this opportunity? Well, in 2007, at the Bill and Melinda Gates Malaria Forum, Bill and Melinda put back malaria elimination eradication, that E word, back on the table. That had been taken off the table in about 1970 
when there was a sense that the global eradication program for malaria started in around 1955, ending in about 1970, wasn't what we were going to do. We were going to do control. Well, the progress that we've had in this last decade have gotten us to the point of seeing control, categorically reducing severe disease infections overall, severe disease and death across huge populations, country by country. It's imperfect, but remarkably better than what it was. So when you get to that point, I'll come back to my uh, a word that people don't like is sustain, you know, do we just sustain what we're doing? Well, the answer is that sustaining what you're doing when you know you could do better is actually just frustration. And we have this opportunity, having seen in a number of countries now, and Masepa and PATH are working very closely, for example, with the Ministry of Health in, in Zambia and in Senegal, where there are parts of the country where there are fewer than five malaria infections per thousand population this year, in the entire year. You can actually find them, and you can go see where the infection came from and where it might have gone to, and go after those. That's what we did in this country. And actually, the Centers for Disease Control was, became the Centers for Disease Control, because it was the, the malaria control program for the United States during the war. And that's what they did. They went after cases and found them and stopped the transmission locally. So we're at a point where our coverage of our interventions for vector control with indoor residual spraying and insecticide-treated nets, our ability to diagnose and properly treat the infections that we find allow us to get to places where there are so few cases we could actually stop those in places like sub-Saharan Africa where malaria had been hugely a problem. That opportunity and not seizing it at this point would be frustrating. Maybe there are a little more serious words out there. But it does have to do with staying this, this course and assuring that we get the resources to make this happen. And believe me, the, the number of lives saved from it will be enormous. So I'll stop there and, uh, and just leave you with the thought that the speed of change isn't slowing down. Um, and the question is whether or not we are able to stay with it. Thanks very much. Rex, th thanks for that uh, really wonderful uh, talk about what uh, can be done, what has been, or what can be done, and what we really need to do, we must do in the in the future to not only sustain, but to accelerate and uh, uh, come back to what Melinda Gates said at that first forum. You know, if we keep on controlling, we'll be spending you know some ten, fifteen billion dollars a year forever. If we uh, get towards this goal of elimination and eradication, then it'll be zero. So that optimistic uh, <laughs> word, we go forward. So our next uh, speaker is uh, Hugh Chang in Seattle, where it's very early in the morning. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, Hugh, uh, uh, I don't know as well as these gentlemen here, but uh, he has been with, uh, with PATH for quite a long time. He's an insider, if, you, if I can say that. That's my impression and obviously uh, into many uh, different aspects of past operations. And now, uh, taking the helm at One, um, One World Health, and he's going to talk to us, I hope, about this uh, amazing uh, semi-synthetic uh, artemisinin and other, other achievements that uh, have taken place. You? Uh, thank you, Carter. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Great. Um, well, thank you for inviting me to, to speak this morning. Uh, I am honored to, to join this panel. I certainly don't have the, uh, the experience that either uh, David or Rick have in malaria. I'm a relative newcomer to the field. But One World Health has been working on this project to create a semi-synthetic version of artemisinin, 
for the past eight years. Um, and it's really, I, I think, a remarkable project. Um, as you've heard from, from David and Rick, you know, PATH certainly has been involved in the prevention and control of uh, malaria. And with our work now at One World Health, we have a, uh, a project that can actually uh, make a significant difference in enabling uh, a stable supply and stable prices for the treatment uh, for malaria. So let me just step back for a second and explain some of the, the background behind um, artemisinin. Um, as many of you may know, uh, artemisinin is the key component in the, uh, the, the standard treatment for malaria called artemisinin com combination therapies. Um, the traditional route for production of artemisinin is through a plant. The plant is typically uh, takes about 15 months from seed to harvesting and the extraction of artemisinin. And uh, there is uh, a dynamic that has been introduced in the marketplace because of the length of that growing time and because the effectiveness of the artemisinin that's extracted uh, diminishes with time. So you can't, uh, you can't grow it and uh, store the medicines that are developed with it uh, for a long period of time. What that results then is in these boom and bust cycles in the supply of artemisinin. Um, over the last uh, 10 years, the price of the artemisinin that is provided to produce these therapies has ranged anywhere from $175 a kilogram to $1,100 a kilogram. It's fluctuated by an order of magnitude almost because of these boom and bust cycles where when farmers see that the price of artemisinin is high, they plant. They plant a, a lot. And then as that supply comes on the market, the, uh, the prices drop because there is a, uh, an excess of supply. That volatility has really affected the, um, the cost structure for the production and uh, delivery of artemisinin combination therapies. So what, uh, what One World Health has done in conjunction with partners at UC Berkeley at a biotech here in uh, the Bay Area called Amaris and now with Sanofi Pasteur is to develop a process that really uses some of the, um, the latest uh, genetic engineering techniques to basically uh, create a non-botanical source of artemisinin. What, uh, what we've been able to do is to take some early research, again, using uh, research funds that were provided at UC Berkeley, to show that you can actually um, identify what the metabolic pathway is in the plant that produces artemisinin and duplicate that, that metabolic pathway in bacteria. We've, uh, the, the team at Berkeley had originally done this in uh, E. coli, and we actually have been able to show, they showed the proof of concept of being able to use bacteria to produce the precursor to artemisinin, which is called artemisinic acid. With Amaris, we were able to transfer that through to uh, a, a different bacterial uh, cell line, yeast. And then with Sanofi Pasteur, we've been able to industrialize that process. And the net result of these activities has been the ability to produce at an industrial scale a non-botanical source of artemisinin that can be used to create these artemisinin combination therapies at a production level that will um, ultimately be equivalent to somewhere about a third, anywhere between a third and a half of the current global demand for artemisinin. The goal of the project is to stabilize supply and stabilize pricing. And what we believe we'll be able to do then through our partners is to uh, produce uh, by the end of 2013 about 40 to 45 tons of artemisinin and be able to uh, supply that at anywhere between $350 and $400 per kilogram, really stabilizing that marketplace 
And we believe over time, through advancements in production technologies, we'll be able to lower that, uh, lower that cost. So I, I guess there are a couple of key things that I think I'd, uh, are important about this. One is um, it, this all started with basic science. It started, I think uh, Rick had mentioned the um, investments in biology, and I think David talked about how those investments in biology have helped to, uh, to uh, think about the potential for a transmission-blocking vaccine that allows us to uh, attack the parasite through antibodies that are um, built in the human, uh, uh, human reserves. In this case, the biology that was used was the biology of the uh, of wormwood, which is the plant from which artemisinin is derived. And by understanding the basic biology of the pathway that wormwood produces artemisinin, identifying the genes that create the, uh, the enzymes to enable that metabolic pathway, and, uh, and transfecting uh, bacteria with that DNA to produce those genes, we've been able to switch the supply from this plant that is grown and harvested to the bacteria that we can ferment um, on demand and be able to produce this new supply of artemisinin. So the, um, you know, the U.S. support of basic research was critical to enabling this to happen at all. Partnerships, as uh, has been in the case of all of the other discussions that we've had, are also key to this. One World Health, working with uh, with uh, UC Berkeley and Amaris was able to provide the initial proof of concept. And then by working with Sanofi Pasteur, we've been able to uh, develop new chemistries and new production technologies that allowed us to go from lab scale processes to industrial scale processes. We're very excited about the, the potential for this. Um, we are, uh, I think by the end of this year, we will have produced um, a few three to five tons of initial artemisinin through uh, the Sanofi production facilities that have been built and are um, uh, beginning to become operational in, uh, in Italy. And by the end of 2013, as I mentioned, we hope to be producing between 40 and 45 tons of artemisinin through this, um, through this uh, fermentation process. So, we're very excited to be part of the overall PATH family. We're very excited to be able to work with our colleagues in the Malaria Vaccine Initiative and in MASEPA to be able to offer a, um, a third leg of the stool in terms of uh, uh, prevention, control, and treatment. And, uh, and I'm happy to be able to, to be here this morning, early for me, <laughs> to be able to, uh, to talk with you. Amazing story, uh, just uh, it's mind boggling. Of course, once you hear it a few times, you get used to mind boggling things happening, and, and that's good. And we move on to more mind boggling things. So, uh, we have uh, a little time for discussion, and uh, are there some questions? Yes. Hello, um, I'm with the USAID project on maternal and child health, MCHIP, and we were just wondering if any of the current programs you guys are running involve anemia or measuring for anemia or using anemia to judge the success of a malaria control program. Rick, you want to take that? Sure. The, um, absolutely. And so, as, as you may realize, there, in terms of the, the large picture of anemia, there are two, ma two major groups of the population that are of concern. One is, well, maybe three. One is pregnant women who, particularly around childbirth, risk the losing blood and needing transfusions, et cetera. Um, a second is surgical patients who need blood. And the third is young children, and there is a combination of iron deficiency anemia, 
um, and acute infections such as uh, hookworm and malaria. Well, malaria is the one that causes the most rapid and severe drop in anemia in young children. And so when you start to control malaria, you categorically control anemia in young children such that an example is I, I was uh, I had an opportunity to visit a, a f health facility in in Macha, which is in Choma District in Zambia. And this is a 200-bed hospital, about 90 beds for child um, illnesses. When I visited there in 2005, they explained to me that in the year 2000, they had, during the malaria season, on average, somewhere between 15 and 30 children in the ward being transfused on a given day. Think about blood transfusions prior to that and HIV infection potential when blood wasn't screened as well as possible and blood transfusions were an enormous potential for not just for um, helping save lives but also for potentially giving serious diseases like HIV and hepatitis. And so today, in 2005 they had a few cases and today they, have, they don't transfuse children. Period. End of story. So you ask about measuring that, and the challenge is that we measure anemia, and anemia has categorically changed in populations with good malaria control. The number of transfusions that we no longer give has probably actually not been quantified as well, and part of that is that blood banking systems were often run in these poor, typically rural areas where there's no blood banking. You have a child that needs a transfusion, you ask the parents to bring themselves or relatives to give blood that day in order to make that transfusion happen. And those don't get counted so easily. So we have not necessarily counted this, but I can tell you that there is story after story in health facilities of they just don't give blood transfusions to young children anymore. Other questions? Yes, here. My name is Fitchett. I am an intern at Fitchett, an intern at Features Group. Um, in, areas where, in, where, in areas where malaria is prevalent, HIV is also a big problem. And my question for you is what has PATH done, especially in pregnant women living with HIV and malaria? Like, for example, I was thinking linking uh, care of malaria with HIV. Thank you. And, and as you may realize, PATH has both groups that work in malaria control, as evidenced here between MSEPA and MVI and, uh, and One World Health. The, the, uh, there is a, a large maternal and child health group. And as part of a standard recommendation for malaria prevention in pregnancy, there, there is a global encouragement for women to get both insecticide-treated nets when they go to antenatal clinic as well as to get intermittent preventive treatment for their malaria. So there is a standard recommendation in the reproductive health community for malaria prevention. That is also sitting side by side with a standard set of recommendations for prevention of maternal to child transmission of HIV. And they're delivered by the same people. So there are sets of guidelines for both of those. And that is indeed part and parcel of the reproductive health program, um, which is supported by PATH in many places. So on the vaccine side, the one thing I would mention is as part of that late stage development of RTSS, obviously a key population to look at is HIV positive individuals. So there's a study ongoing to look at both the safety and immunogenicity of RTSS and HIV positive individuals. So that's an important component of the program. Hi, Ashley with um, PSI. I'm just curious, I think um, one of the things that we can talk about with malaria control in the last 10 years is the involvement of the private sector. 
And I'm just curious, as funding streams shift, um, vaccines are available and things, how you see the role of the private sector either shifting with vaccines, ACTs, um, and where you see sort of that role um, evolving in the next decade or so. Quick comment. I mean, I think the goal is for it all to be in the private sector, and you know we don't have to be involved anymore. But uh, was that a kind of uh, flippant answer, uh, Rick? You want to take a shot? Yeah. Actually, I think there. I mean, the the private sector, and David can speak to this as well. Hugely important, obviously, hugely important in terms of developing new tools. At the same time that. Um, you could look at, for example, businesses in, in various in malaria endemic countries and what their role and responsibility is for their, um, for their workforce, for the families of their workforce, et cetera. And they're, they're an increasingly a set of examples of companies that have invested in malaria control for their workforce and for their families of their workforce and get return on that investment. That is, they get more money earnings back than they spend on that. And so we, there is a, uh, a Rollback Malaria Progress and Impact Series um, report on this. And if, if I draw your attention to that, it's out on the Rollback Malaria website. There's a, a site on that website on the front page that says Progress and Impact Series. And there's a private sector report on that. Um, highlighting the fact that a number of companies, so Ashanti Gold, um, a company that mines gold and produces uh, you know, the material and sells it at huge profit, um, realized that when they control malaria in their workforce and get better productivity out of their workforce, they make back more money than they spend on that malaria control. Same was true for the sugar industry and for the copper mining industry in Zambia. So that's actually a good investment. It's harder to show that for the company that has 10 employees. But to be honest, in the private sector, investment in malaria control for your workforce, no matter how big or how small, is probably both a good social responsibility as well as it's likely to pay for itself if not get your return on the investment. Hugh, you, you, would you like to comment on that question, uh, the role of the private sector? Well, certainly, um, you know, our, our goal is to enable the, the production of ACDs um, in a more economical uh, fashion. One of the things that we have certainly experienced in our uh, partnership with Sanofi is a very um, uh, clear and open commitment to being able to um, supply all WHO qualified um, manufacturers of ACTs with this new supply of artemisinin. So um, we do view, uh, obviously, the private sector as, uh, as our key constituent and the uh, method by which this new technology will actually have its impact on, uh, on malaria. So from a vaccine point of view, it should be obvious and probably goes without saying that without GSK, RTSS would not be where it is today and that um, their role in it over the last 27 years has been critical to advancing this to the point of, um, of phase three studies. And, you know, we anticipate that those types of partnerships are going to be critically important for, um, for next generation vaccines as, as well. We're getting close to the end. We have uh, a couple of questions. First in the front uh, here. Uh, th thank you very much uh, to Dr. David, Dr. Rick, and uh, huge for a wonderful presentation. Um, uh, I really like the word uh, um, the speed of change. And uh, this speed of change, I think, has really catch up the clinician as well. I'll give an example, like in Zambia, uh, most, most doctors actually were, were actually considering all fever as malaria. So when malaria was actually controlled, <laughs> I think they, start, they were quite confused. 
Um, uh, now my question is, as we are controlling this malaria, I believe we have also to update the doctors, we have to update the clinician to actually do a better diagnosis because they may actually be uh, doing wrong diagnosis and then we have a wrong um, 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 figures of malaria being captured there. Thank you. And was the question here, I think, or? Yeah, let me let me take a shot at it and see. And please, uh, uh, you can finish off when I when it should all be incomplete. But I think the gist of it is that what about the end game of uh, new interventions? What about the logistics? You know, what about the cold chain? What about all those things that you have a wonderful product from a company, but then how do you get it to where it's needed? And um, Hugh, uh, we'll take that. Sure, I, I, I'll start. Um, the honestly, the work that One World Health has done is upstream of the logistics. Um, as as uh, you may know, artemisinin actually needs to go through some additional processing um, into one of three different derivatives of artemisinin that are used in the uh, ACTs. So um, we will be relying on our private sector partners uh, for the distribution of the ACTs that are developed. And One World Health in particular has not focused on, uh, on resolving uh, many of those issues. I will say that through some of the efforts that are, being, that are going on with respect to um, trying to improve access and affordability of ACTs, we're seeing spikes in the demand for ACTs. Um, it, it is, uh, I agree with you, unclear that uh, the spikes in demand that we're seeing in terms of purchasing that seem to be going to the central stores, it's unclear how much of that is actually making it out uh, to the districts and to the uh, individuals who are in need of the ACTs. So I agree it's, a, it's an issue. Um, it's not one that One World Health has been focused on. I'm sure you could add some insight into this in terms of what's really happening on the ground. And uh... yeah, so I'll take both comments. I, I think the the comment about the training for physicians, the indeed, you know, as as a physician, we're the worst. That is, we think we know better than than everything else. We don't follow algorithms very well. Um, we think we're above that. Um, having said that, um, the, the idea of training people, this speed of change is absolutely that. That is the health workforce that's out there, whether it's at the community level and community health workers or up into the hospitals uh, and, and everything in between um, is a huge issue because things have changed and they've changed quite dramatically. Um, on the supply chain issue, I think that <clears throat> you raise one of the thorns in, in everybody's side. Um, I, it's clearly frustrating that we, that we, the larger public health community, has been working with identifying new tools and getting, you know, the best biologic products to be available, and yet some of the systems that deliver them or should be delivering them are maybe not as strong as they should be. And this is where I would say that technology and the speed of that change potentially has us at a juncture where that could change. We now have 
for example, cell phones in the hands of you know, health, health workers out in rural health clinics who can call up or send a text message and say, I'm running low. And we're increasingly, in, in a number of places where PATH is working, are advocating for that as being part of the reporting process. That is, it's not just calling out, we had a case, but saying, we use this many diagnostic tests, and we use this many ACTs, and we're short of nets, and this is our supply need this week. And if you don't get it to us, we'll tell you that our supply need is greater next week because we continue to use. And that, that should change things. And, and I'm just, I'm raising this because I think you're absolutely right to work on it. This is a huge issue. It's not for any given disease. It's a, it's a systemic problem. And to be honest, we've had foreign assistance in this arena for decades. And it's not clear to me that we've got examples of you know, solutions that have been made. At the same time that DHL can get you your package someplace anywhere on the globe and tell you where it is at any moment in time on that road. And so the technology is there, the incentives may not be there, and we ought to look hard at that because what's the, what's the private sector and the public sector incentive to actually deliver that service? And it has to be clear, because otherwise it's not going to happen. So maybe I'll just say a few words about the approach and the thinking that one takes in vaccines. I think we've, we, the industry, everyone's learned <laughs> kind of the hard way that some of the vaccines that have been developed initially with the developed world in mind and then have been kind of retrofitted into the, into the developing world, um, that's been a, a tough transition. And I think, you know, one of the standard tools that industry uses is to sit down at the beginning of the project and to map out kind of what are the key attributes that need to be made in order for this thing, one, to, to work, but also to be used. And it's called a targeted product profile. And to really think carefully about kind of the end user and what's going what's gonna to happen. I can assure you that here at, um, at MVI and, in, and now in the malaria vaccine field, that that's been a tool that's been adopted and to start thinking about these things really early on, even at the early feasibility, so we're really clear where we're going and what those key attributes need to be. So I can tell you to change those attributes at or after the time of licensure is a huge, a huge undertaking. So, you know, we hear you. Um, loud and clear, but I think there are some tools that can be brought to bear on this to address those questions. I would just comment that coming back to the already available products, this, as you as you know, I'm sure is is always a very pervasive issue, and, and I, I think it's safe to say that with the PMI activities in Washington, much of the effort, and Linda can correct me if I'm wrong on this is devoted to precisely what you're talking about. And I see emails coming across my desk that have to do with, you know, how many how many uh, hundreds of, of units of such and such an intervention uh, is flowing to a given place uh, and so on at a given time. So it's, it's huge. And uh, from the very beginning, with the target product profile uh, right to the very end, it's, it's huge. Um, yes, we have a question. Linda, you want to? I'm Linda Banda. I work on the um, procurement and um, commodities team for PMI. So when we hear, you know, sup uh, stable supply and prices of artemisinin and is something that we think about on a daily basis. Um, I was just wondering, you had stated that uh, the current plant-based um, um, extraction, it, I mean, it, it, it takes 15 months from seed to extraction. For the non-botanical process, how long is that process going to take when you're using um, the, the bacteria? Sure. It's, um, it's actually a continuous process. So there are, um, there are fermentation facilities in which the bacteria are growing constantly, and we basically take batches out of, that ferment, out of those fermenters and bring them into the production line that uses the chemistry to convert, to extract the, uh, the 
uh, artemisinic acid, which is the precursor to artemisinin, and introduce that into the production system to convert that into artemisinin. So it is a continuous process. Um, it is not seasonal at all. Um, and I, I, honestly, I don't know from the beginning of the fermentation process to the output of uh, artemisinin, I'm, I don't know for sure how long that, that takes, but it would be a constant supply throughout the year of, of artemisinin. I think there was a question here. Uh-huh. Yeah. Hi, my name is Andrew Foote. I come from uh, the water and sanitation and social entrepreneurship field. And my question has to do um, to continue discussing the market incentivization of the last mile of the supply chain, especially when you're talking about a vaccine. And, you know, in the water sanitation field, a term we throw around a lot is demand creation. If um, the panelists could share some, some thoughts on, on what have been successful demand creation stories in malaria prevention, and especially when migrating to a vaccine, what do we see as the new strategies and techniques for demand creation with a vaccine? I think that's across the board of our, our panel here. So, Rick, why don't you start off? Yeah. Actually, a fair amount for the malaria vaccine, uh, MVI, uh, I don't mean to speak to this, yeah. David, but MVI started early on in its approach to, to work with countries, both at leadership level and down into communities, to ask about what, what the impact of a vaccine would be. Do they understand it? Do they, how do they curr value currently available vaccines? And what would be the differences and the issues for, for a malaria vaccine? So that work has, has already started. And it's also true across all of the interventions. And I think this is one of, going back to my comment about success, the, the, the example is that communities have, have taken up these interventions to high coverage when they've become available. We just had an example in, uh, again, in Zambia, where we've gone into a district to ask them about testing and treating the entire population of the district. And as you may know, there's a history of doing mass drug administration for populations, or in this case, it was mass testing and treatment of those who are infected. People lined up in droves, and we tested probably 95% of the entire population of the district in that inter designated interval of time because the message was out there that I'm going to get tested and I may have malaria and I don't know it because many people are asymptomatic and this would allow me to get know whether or not I have it and get treated for it at the same time. And people came. And so our experience to date with all of our interventions is that this is the good side of malaria. There is not stigma around this disease. And um, there are no m mosquito advocacy groups that I'm aware of. Um, <laughs> And, and so we've got, uh, we've got a nice situation where the uptake of the whole spectrum of interventions is actually pretty darn good. Yes, there are issues, and there's some misuse issues, but this has been pretty good. So I, I understand your question, actually, having come from industry and understanding demand creation and, and, and that sort of thing. What I would say, though, is, is sitting in MVI, I think the frame of reference is a little bit is a little bit different and what our goal is is the optimal use of the vaccine right in a variety of different settings and to generate the data that's required right and it is in a in a rational decision making framework to allow the right decisions to be made in terms of how to use that vaccine it is a new tool how do we best use that vaccine and so it's not really demand creation, it's like how to use a new tool in the optimal way possible. And I think that's the frame of reference that we would bring to it. Hugh, you have a comment? Yeah, I would just uh, uh, echo what uh, Rick and David have said. I would also point out that I think um, to the earlier question about supply and logistics uh, systems, I think it's very important to be able to uh, to match the demand creation with the ability to actually meet that demand, and so um, one you don't you don't want to be generating um, a huge amount of demand and not be able to supply it, and then create some 
um, some dissatisfaction in those uh, those uh, those users of the the various interventions. So I think it, it is very important, and it's very important to do it um, in a coordinated way across the the whole spectrum of interventions and um, logistic systems. Yeah, just just to uh, underline what's been said. I mean, this this is a very very glad you pointed this out, David. There's a real difference uh, between uh, the interest of a you know a, a public company, you know, it's a you know a pharmaceutical, and the um, uh, and the community the, at large in terms of best use of, of products. And uh, I mean, you said it. I'll just emphasize it that. Rick has talked about how eager people are for something to help, some intervention. We don't want to take advantage of that to uh, deliver the wrong product. So that's uh, just to emphasize what's been saying. Yes, sir. My question uh, on artemisinin uh, non, uh, non botanical production. I'm wondering whether some research done or addressing the drug resistance, whether this. Uh, newly developed uh, technology may or may not facilitate the, the development of drug resistance to artemisinin. Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the end of the question. Well, let, let me repeat it and see if I get it right. I think I misunderstood it too, but let me give both, both my interpretations. So if I understand your question was, uh, is the use of the semi-synthetic product, is that, will that in any way facilitate development of drug resistance. On the other side of the coin, which I thought you were getting to, is there a way that you can maybe preempt the development of resistance through a uh, synthetic uh, product? So, you, a couple of questions for you. Sure. So, um, I, I don't believe that the semi-synthetic version of, of artemisinin will um, have any impact, uh, any different impact than the botanical source of artemisinin on drug resistance. Um, our goal, our very specific goal is bioequivalence so that we can reduce the regulatory hurdles that will be in place in order for this form of artemisinin to be uh, able to be uh, used to replace the botanical form. So we are trying to actually build the identical version just using a different production technique. It's an interesting question about whether the uh, there may be some techniques to be able to modify the uh, the semi-synthetic version of artemisinin. I actually don't know enough about what uh, causes drug resistance and whether, therefore, there are any um, any changes that could be introduced that would uh, through this semi-synthetic process to reduce the drug resist the growing drug resistance. David Kessel reminded me that we have a gentleman in the room that might want to comment on that. Tom Wellams. So I'm Tom Wellams. I uh, run a, uh, a malaria research at uh, laboratory at the NIH, and we do quite a bit of research on drug resistance, and particularly this artemisinin resistance threat is, is on our radar in a, a big way right now. Uh, the, uh, the characteristic of this threat of artemisinin resistance is in those infections you can see it in the clinical clearance of the parasites. They're, they're delayed. They respond slowly to the drug. And there's some evidence now that that slow clearance over the three-day course of drug treatment will not eliminate the parasites well enough for the partner of the drug in the ACT to clear them out. And then you'll see an increased number of recrudescences coming two to four weeks later, and even longer, out to six weeks. Uh, so the question is, can we use what we know from this uh, basic clinical knowledge and also from what we know of the characteristics of the drug from the plant to develop new uh, pharmaceuticals that can take advantage of the warhead, the active component of the artemisinin, and make, uh, make it more... Um, effective in the treatment of these delayed clearances. So uh, Hugh described the biological production in yeast of, of artemisinin at a synthetic level. There are also chemical uh, synthetic methods uh, that involve ent entirely new structural entities. 
with the peroxide warhead of the artemisinin now involving flanking uh, chemicals, or moieties we call them, that are put together in a different way. And one of these, in particular with the malaria, Medicines for Malaria Partnership that is uh, a sister of MVI out of Geneva, one, one of these compounds called an ozonide, ozonide number 439, has a very long half-life compared to the short half-life of the drug from the plants. And we're, uh, it's now in advanced phase trials, has gone through preclinical uh, pre testing. And the question is, can this ozonide match the delayed clearances, uh, or the, 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 uh, the tolerance of, to the herbal remedy, and be more effective, even as a one-dose therapy? So if, if MMV now can find a partner for the ozonide 439 that um, is also has suitable characteristics, it might be possible to develop a, a single dose therapy with long life of the new ozonide, long life of the partner, a direct observed therapy much like happens in tuberculosis treatment given in the clinic and take care of, uh, hopefully, two problems. One is the delayed clearance of these new strains, and also the patient compliance issues over three days therapy. Many patients don't complete their therapy, and some studies have shown it's an abysmally low number of patients who comply with the full course, as the, the panel well knows. Um, and so we, we have basic science, we have new drug resistant strains to deal with, and also a, um, in delivery, the, the completions of the, the therapies and appropriate uh, receipt of the th ther therapy by the patients. And these new compounds um, are, are hopefully going to address many of those issues. I see a question here. Um, one question I have about the vaccine. Um, has any thought been given to the cost of the vaccine and how it's going to be rolled out in terms of creating effective demand? After things you mentioned, things you said, everything, I would not take complete issue with that, but I would wonder if we would be this far if there hadn't been substantial public support for um, activities like rollback malaria and global fun and, and PMI. Um, so where is the effect of demand uh, entering into this in terms of, of how it's going to be financed once it's ready for market? You know, I doubt that any of us here can really answer that, that question, uh, but I think clearly what you alluded to is that uh, malaria is not uh, a high profit, uh, you know, uh, entity for, for entrepreneurship. So it's absolutely essential that the, the public sector play its role uh, to, I, I like to think of it as an analogy to physical chemistry and to activation energy. We have to put in the activation energy into the system so that at some point, you know, there will be an incentive for the private sector. And, but that's still going to come uh, from the public. I mean, let's, let's don't kid ourselves. The public is really going to be ultimately responsible. But over time, and I was being a little bit flippant when I said all to the to the uh, private sector, uh, you know, if, if eradication is achieved, then, you know, this thing goes away. So that's a very, very long-term goal, this is eradication itself. But uh, I think that's one of the things that was being talked about uh, by Melinda Gates when she, when she talked about this whole idea of resurrecting the E-word. Anybody else want to comment? And probably the only thing to point out here is, is that for a variety of other vaccines that um, are you know, currently available in the developed world and we're trying to uh, provide access and availability for them in the developing world. There's what we call a dual market. So there's a private market and a public market and there's ways to kind of balance those two to make things to make things happen. I think one of the unique things here with this malaria vaccine, and it's going to require some innovative thinking, is, is how do you do that in the absence of a private market? Because this is really targeted to a public to a public market. So I think there's going to need to be some new thinking that goes along with you know, how do you deal with those those issues. And what we've used in the past, right, for taking things from the developed world and the developing world may or may not apply here. Uh, 
Let me just make a comment about Tom's, Tom's mentioning of, uh, of new opportunities in drugs. Uh, just to highlight, that's an, yet another example of the progress that's being made. And this is, this is w a wonderful time for a balance between advances in the biology, m moving to partnership in the, uh, in the, you know, the, the public-private partnership for the development. And if we had a single-dose treatment, that would yet again change the, the name of the way things are done and the efficacy and effectiveness of programs out there. And that could happen overnight with the availability of a new drug that's a single dose, highly effective antimalarial. So just, just to point out the, the, that opportunity that sits in front of us and, uh, and something that we hope all comes to fruition. Hugh, would you like to comment on this, this question of the uh, role of uh, private versus public sector going forward? And well, I, you know, I, I um, think that the same, uh, many of the same issues that the vaccine faces in terms of the, um, the lack of a dual market exists for many of the drugs. Um, I think it is clear that um, there are there are uh, many mechanisms that are being deployed to try to um, e improve the accessibility and the affordability of these drugs, and certainly uh, partnerships like uh, those that have been established by MMV and those that we're developing here at One World Health with pharmaceutical manufacturers to be able to um, sort of uh, reach that activation energy that that David had talked about in terms of. Um, enabling an economic uh, picture that uh, lowers the hurdle rates for some of the uh, private sector companies in return for achieving the public health benefits is a, a calculus that I think we, we think about in each interaction that we have with our private sector partners. We're now really coming close to the end, but uh, time for another one or two questions, I think. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mindy, and I'm from Tanzanian Embassy. Um, and um, I just wanted to comment a little bit on uh, at, uh, on the complications, I guess, that are derived from malaria, and especially towards malaria patients. Um, having born and raised in Dar es Salaam, I mean, I grew up there. And just recently, my daughter uh, and I was admitted at the hospital because she is asthmatic, so I was there for an asthmatic case. And next, a bed next to me was a, a lady with another, uh, with a baby. Uh, of course, the baby was a little bit old, uh, younger than my, my baby. Uh, I think he was about five months old. And um, when she came back for the, th for the third time in that same hospital, that's when we were together. We were admitted in the same, in the same room. And they, they, they just couldn't find out how, how severe the baby's malaria was and due to I don't know what whichever complication that was but it was very severe and I was released the next day but I left her at the hospital and of course I left her with a lot of you know liquids and things that can help uh, her with, with the baby so um, two days later I'm calling her just to find out because we developed relations and, and I was just trying to see how the baby was doing and the baby had passed away and and it the the thing is, the problem was so real, and from talking to her, I learned that she has been to that hospital three times, but they said the baby didn't have malaria, and yet he had malaria, and he died from, from malaria. So as we're talking about advancing research and, and new technology and, of course, uh, vaccine for, for malaria, I think the, the disease actually, in, in, for instance, in Tanzanians' case, um, it, has, it is also evolving and developing new complications that we didn't know them before. So this genuine symptoms or the common symptoms for malaria may not exist in today's world. So as, you know, as discussions are going on in, in, in eradicating malaria, and I think uh, my government also has done quite a, quite a number of initiatives, and as a matter of fact in Zanzibar, which is our other side of the union,